Director of Civic Activation and a Regional Program Manager for uh, Vocational Wellbeing for Vine and Fig Tree. We provide essentially vocational training for under-resourced youth in this area, and then also technical training to allow them to enter the workforce and connect them with local uh, tech companies that'll provide them internships, along with community mentorship, and then a mentor within uh, the company itself. So I get to have my hands on a lot of different pots with my job, which is really exciting to me. I'm particularly passionate about the vocational part because I think you can get technical training anywhere. But a lot of us, I mean, myself included, you know, my age included, I'm not 18 anymore, you know, have missed out on this part of like discovering who you are and what you are meant to do and your purpose. And I think the sooner you can discover that and really feel confident and strong in that, the better off everybody is. Because if you're working in your purpose, you're working for a purpose and you feel, you know, more passionate about it and then, and all that kind of stuff. You know, you go through all these years of training and of school, you know, Mm -hmm. general education, and it it very much is damn general. You know, it's only, it's 12 years. And when you graduate, it's like, okay, so what about purchasing a home? I have no idea what interest rates mean. I don't understand what my purpose is. We miss so many key elements that I feel like could replace other things that we learn in school. I learned something in 10th grade called Hawaiian algebra. Have you ever heard of it? Never heard of it. They discontinued it after my year of having to suffer through it because it was ridiculous. And instead of teaching kids all this kind of stuff or like really like trigonometry, I've never used that in my life. Not in anything I've ever done. Have I had to use interest rates and figure out, you know, payment schedules and all sorts of other stuff? Yes. Right. <laughs> Why aren't we learning that? To that, what we talked about too, that critical thinking and that discernment. Yes. And being able to look at things and understand why it happens and understand how to not have it happen again. Right. Yeah. And you can't, if you're only given one version of things and told like, this is it, repeat it, you know? <laughs> right. And for the longest time, that's only been, that's been the map that we've had. Mm-hmm. And no one's challenged the map. No one's challenged anything about it. And sometimes it happens and then some people drop the ball. And, and it's like, at what point do we get to where we're like, okay, enough is enough. Our kids really need this instruction and we need to push to have these things in school because it's going to make us better people. Yeah. You know, why are we learning so why are we learning trig? So, so when do you when do you need trigonometry? <laughs> Not for any job I'm ever gonna do, that's for sure. Right. With regards to being an advocate and educating yourself, I totally understand. I was the same way. You hear about an issue and it just it really gets it digs in and it gets you and you can't let go of it, right? You and you want to do something about it, which is great. I'm not knocking that. We need people to do that. But when you come into a situation thinking <clears throat> that you are some sort of like white knight or savior mm-hmm. and you're going to save these poor people, um, that's just a recipe for absolute disaster because for many reasons. So like one, nobody wants to be pitied, right? Right. Nobody. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. You know, if you're on the street and you're homeless, you don't want someone to come up and be like, oh, I'm so sorry. You let me save you. Um, but also you're, you're not educated enough to really understand the complexity of all the issues. Mm-hmm. And I think the um, Netflix show made really does a good job of talking about that in the domestic violence um, sphere of how it's not just violence. Like you have a whole system set against you to get out. I have been blown. I'm blown away by that show and because it's not, graphic. It doesn't go into like a lot of violence, like physical behavior, but it talks about the um, emotional abuse, the financial abuse, the Mm -hmm. manipulation. And then once you try to get out, how the system is not set up to actually help you because, you know, in order to get help, you have to have a job. Well, in order to have a job, you have to have childcare, but you can't have childcare until you have a job. Or money. So how are you, you know, it's like all, all this stuff. So, and that's something that most people who've never been in that situation even have a clue about. Right. So I love that this, the show did this, but also if you're going to get in and want to help people like, try to understand to the best of your ability, exactly what they're up against, because it's not just as easy as 
pulling yourself up by your bootstraps not. and, and deciding to, to get out, whether it's, uh, you know, domestic violence, whether it's human trafficking, whether it is, you know, you're in a bad, like foster youth situation, you know, all of these things have so much more behind them. And then mm-hmm. same with an organization. If I hear one more organization say, oh, we're the voice for the voiceless, I'm going to have my head explode because these people aren't voiceless. Yeah. yeah. They're just not being given a seat at the table and they need to be given a seat at the table. Right. And there's so many elements to being in a a situation. um, And I'll just speak from my own personal experience. When you are in a situation where you're going through uh, abuse, you are so psychologically programmed to think Mm -hmm. a certain way. You don't realize that that programming has been going on for years. Mm-hmm. So you can't just undo it. Right. And sometimes if, if people come in and try to be that savior, oh, I want to save you. Let me help you. And they realize that, you know, you're still dealing with stuff. You, you have to understand what you're getting into as well, stepping into it. Oh, absolutely. I remember I had a neighbor who was beaten by her husband badly. I mean. Oh, her face, it was like, it's so distorted. You can't even recognize her, the way it looked. And we heard screams and she ran to our house and just banged on the door. And like when um, my ex-husband opened the door, she ran in the door, just ran in our home with just the t-shirt on and no pants, all bloody. Her face was messed up. And she uh, said that he did have a weapon on him. So now we're in danger because we don't know what his frame of mind is. And we just kind of got thrown in the situation. And because we were witnesses, you know, if this had things like that happen, you go to court, there's a restraining order and all this other stuff, but you have to show up. Well, she didn't show up. And I remember that feeling of why the hell didn't she show up? Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like you kind of get mad. You're like, I've done all of this stuff. Right. But, (laughs) and you know, and this is coming from someone who's been there. I had to remind myself, like, <laughs> girl, you, that was you, you know? And so me being reminded and put, it, and put back into that situation, it brought it all back of the psychological uh, manipulation and everything that's going on. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and, and it can frustrate you as someone who is putting yourself out there trying to help, but you have to understand that, you know, not everyone is in that mental space and not everyone is ready. And not only that, when someone takes that extra step to go and leave, then like you said, the system is not set up to help them. It's very easy to go back somewhere where at least you have a roof over your head, even if you're getting your exactly. ass every day. Yeah. yeah. It's the devil, you know, versus the one you don't, what you don't and all the hardship and being homeless and not having a place, not having clothes yeah. or money, or, you know, if you're a parent, like a place for your kids, because then that will happen. Then you get your kids taken away. Exactly. And then if you think about, I mean, there's so many elements and, you know, seriously, I salute any woman who's ever gone through that and made it through to where she is on her own and living her life independently yeah. of the person who she was abused by. And the reason that I say that is because I didn't have children when I was in my situation. Um, had I had kids, I don't know how I would have left. People yeah. think that a lot of times the abuser has rights as well, right? And exactly. putting yourself in a position where you are in proximity to this abuser, a lot of times that's how these women are losing their lives because they have to see this person again because they share a child together or more more than one child. And I feel like no one's really considering the safety of these women. And it's a scary situation to think about. I mean, the courts don't look at a lot of the things. They're just, okay. 50-50, 50-50, you have 50%, you know, child care, so does the guy. Mm-hmm. Have fun with it, you know? They're not looking at all of the other things or what for whatever legal reasons mm-hmm. can't 
but it does nothing but harm the children and make the the women stay. I mean, yes, there's sometimes where men are abused too. <clears throat> I don't want to discount that, but it's more often than not women. What are some of the things that you feel like are are needed 100% for it to work effectively and actually help people? I think I think my number one thing, honestly, if you want to take it down to like the tiny, tiny level, because we can get like real deep in the weeds about like change in laws and all that kind of stuff, but that's not easy to do overnight, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you can't do that as an individual. But if you pay attention to your neighbors and invest in the people who like literally live around you in their lives, that's a huge thing. Like to know that my, you know, this whole pandemic, like both sets of my neighbors, like we've been giving each other food, we've watched each other's kids, you know, like we're involved in each other's lives. But like, think about if everyone did that. Right. And then if, if someone in a situation needed to get out, could stash a, a go bag at their neighbor's house could give their other neighbor you know documents to hold on to and in a way to like get their kids and to like navigate a way to get out of the system where they didn't feel quite so alone mm-hmm. and that wasn't going to go back and and tell the spouse that's involved oh hey like I've got you know st- you know she's thinking about leaving you yeah. um so I think if we want to go like on a really small level that each individual person can very easily do, pay attention, pay attention attention to your neighbors, invest in their lives. You don't have to be all up in their business all the time. I'm big on boundaries, have boundaries. Yeah. But, and know what your boundaries are too, because it's very easy to let someone walk all over them or get way too involved. And then you're like, Whoa, I didn't mean to like, watch your kid for a couple of days. I just said they could come over for a snack, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You make a good point. You make a really good point to make sure that you are serving on a micro level. And I agree with you because if you think about it, if we were to come together as a community and my name, na- myself and my neighbors and, you know, like say there's five of us, even if it's, there's just five of us, five people serving each other. In this community, there's five people serving each other. That honestly does a lot when you think about it, because a lot of times, because we don't work as a community, there's one person who bears the load, and then yep. it strains the relationship. Their boundaries get crossed because they never set them in the first place. Yeah. And then what could happen because that's happened even to me before the relationship, uh, it, it gets tarnished and, Mm -hmm. you know, it destroys the relationship because the person was taking on too much in the first place. Yeah. And we're not built to, we're built to work together, you know, not to take on someone's whole mess. Whole networking aspect to it too. And I don't mean networking in like the slimy kind of way (laughs) that a lot of people think about it, but it's, you know, if you, if you know each other, and then, you know, someone needs help. You can be like, wait a minute. I know so-and-so that I can talk to you for you to get, get this help. You know, I just had that whole conversation with another friend and another different nonprofit today where we were looking for a finance person. And she was like, wait a minute. I know a guy and yeah. he does specific finance stuff for nonprofits and all this kind of stuff. She's like, let me connect you guys. So then I can connect, you know, so it's just about making those connections and being authentic and paying attention. It doesn't have to be, you know, a getting up on a horse and like saving the day and writing, you know, doing anything super dramatic. It's great when we have those moments, but yeah, that's not sustainable and you can't do that every day. And if you are, you're going to burn out. I don't care how much energy or passion you have for anything. Right. You're going to burn out in the most fantastic, awful way. <laughs> <laughs> so at Binding Fig Tree, our tagline, so to speak, is to heal social and economic injustices. And that's a huge thing. Um, but what we're doing is, again, sort of on the micro level, is taking an area and working with the youth, the under-resourced youth in that area to give them the vocational training, uh, community mentorship, which you can speak on, um, yeah. <laughs> and then placing them within a technology company, feeling supported and surrounded. And I think that's a thing that has been missing largely. We've looked at a lot of different organizations that do similar work to us, and they all have the technical training, right? And mm-hmm. some of them even have you know, mentorship, but they don't have 
all of these together combined with the vocational training. And by vocational training, I don't mean, you know, more job training. I know that word is kind of, it means something different to me than it means to a lot of other people. It's talking about your purpose and who you were meant to be and discovering that. Last night, I was actually talking to some foster youth and I was really impressed by one young man who was was telling me, he was like, you know, I don't, it's like a lot of the programs that we go to, go to like through the foster care system are meant for survival. And he said, we weren't born to survive. We were born to live with a purpose and do what, what God put us on this earth to do. And that, I mean, coming from like the mouth of like an 18 year old was really powerful. And I was like, absolutely. You know, that is what this program, I think, fills the gap in for is, is finding that purpose and understanding what you want to do and then having that support around you to cheer you on and to motivate you and to help you figure out all those other steps along the way. I uh, was introduced through you, like you told me about the program and asked if I wanted to be a mentor. And like I I tell people all the time, I was thinking in my head, uh, uh, hell no, (laughs) no way. Well, well, also, I don't know if you remember me saying this when I asked you, I was like, you don't have to say no, but I'm speaking it into existence. (laughs) Because I was excited. So when I thought about it, like my initial answer was like, yeah, of course. But inside I was like, what what do you think you are? Like, no, (laughs) but it is one of the most rewarding things I've ever done because I think about how I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a role model. If I don't even thinking back, I'm like, who was my role model growing up? I didn't have Wait. one. Yeah, I didn't have one either. Yeah. And um, a lot of people, they would, you know, I would hear them say, oh, when I was growing up, I used to listen to such and such and he or she changed my life. And I always felt a little empty in that space, a little unfulfilled because I didn't have that. And even to have a mentor would have been good for me, especially being that I felt like I was navigating all on my own. And for me, I think that it fulfills me because I get to stand beside someone and be what I didn't have. Because yes. sometimes I just needed someone to talk to, someone who was older, who had been through a few things and tra- I've been through some stuff. Yes. <laughs> Like, I can tell you what not to do. <laughs> right. You know? And, you know, for that, uh, I'm very grateful because um, I just adore my mentee because I see the drive in her. She has so much drive. And she does. Even, she's a young adult who is, is still finding out who she is. She is still learning about herself, but her heart and her drive and her passion it always like shines through all of that. Like you see it and it just makes me really proud. It makes me really proud. And I I didn't have anyone next to me to even see that. But I think that just words of affirmation for anyone Mm -hmm. is so important. It's very rewarding. And these, these young adults really need to have someone to support them. And you're right. They don't need a job. They don't need to be surviving. We are all create. We all have gifts. And just yep. because someone had to go through the foster care system does not make them any less important or their vision any less important than anyone else's. And just to feel seen as a person is so, I mean, that in itself is such a powerful gift mm-hmm. for anybody. It doesn't matter where you came from, just, just to feel seen and acknowledged like, hey, I I see that light in you and I see your drive or I see how hard you're working, you know, whatever it is, everyone needs that. So how did you also get into doing advocacy for human trafficking? You know, I, it's funny, (laughs) you know me, I like to argue with people and I like to just (laughs) like, no, this is wrong. So I was in a book club and we read this book and it was about uh, international trafficking. And I, I'd heard about international trafficking for years. Right. And I was like, so, you know, it's an over there problem. Mm -hmm. But in this book, there was probably two sentences about this guy who's in DC and saw some girl get kidnapped and, and he was like, oh yeah, trafficking happens all the time in Washington, DC. And I was like, 
there is no way that happens. So <laughs> me, because I like to argue about things. So I was like, yeah. this book is, is garbage. Like I'm going to prove it wrong. So I started getting online and I started looking up information. And not only did I find out that <laughs> human trafficking was like a huge problem, like so much more than what I ever thought, wow. but it was happening not just in GC, but it was happening in my area. And so I'm, I'm not one to, you know, decide I'm right. And then see facts and then not change my mind so I totally changed my mind and I was like why am I just finding out about this yeah just because I happen to look it up because I wanted to have an argument with a book (laughs) (laughs) so and then at the same time I had gone on a like local mission with my church went down in the city in DC and I met and talked with a couple who recommended a book called Toxic uh, Charity. And I read the book and it was really convicting about how evangelical Christians in America tend to want to go elsewhere to do um, mission mission trips because it's a whole lot easier to go somewhere else, do a mission, feel good about yourself Mm -hmm. and then come back to your nice home. Mm. And it's a whole lot easier to do things other places other than trying to make a difference in your own neighborhood. And these people talked about that too. They had decided to move into um, Southeast DC and they took care of all the kids who didn't have parents in their neighborhood. Just like literally had them move in and would go to jail, like bail them out of jail, like help take them to rehab, like all of these things that there wasn't another adult around to, to do that. And they're like, if you really want to make a difference, if you really want to think that, you know, go, go to sleep at the end of night and feel exhausted, but actually know that you did something, right. you're going to find what your community needs mm. and make a difference there. And I, that meant that like really hit me hard and was convicting. So I was like, you know what, if I'm having this like powerful thing about human trafficking and I can't stop thinking about it and I know it's happening in my neighborhood, I need to find more information about it. I need to start talking about it. I need to start doing things. So that's kind of where I started. And then things sort of fell into place with, you know, finding places to volunteer. And then, you know, when I volunteer, I I go, I go 110%. So people are like, do you want to do more? And I'm like, yes, (laughs) give me all the things. So (laughs) that's how, you know, I ended up getting more and more like deeper into the human, yeah. tra- into human trafficking uh, so world. What, what would you say was the most eye-opening thing that you learned about the trafficking industry that made you take a step back and be like, wow, I cannot believe this is happening? I think the most powerful one was the power of coercion. You think that thanks to Hollywood, that people are kidnapped or taken by force and, you know, chained to a bed. There's lots of images and and stuff like that. And that's not honestly how that happens domestically. Mm -hmm. And and understanding coercion, you know, and how it can make you do things that you didn't think you were, like if someone took my kid and they said, if you don't go rob this bank, you know, and and you have 10 minutes to make a decision. If you don't go rob this bank, I'm going to put a bullet through her head. I sure as heck would be going and robbing the bank. Yeah. You know, because you're in that fight or flight mode and any other decision process that you might have had logically while you're sitting there behind your computer, you know, with nothing else to do, like goes out the window and you're like, I'm going to go rob the bank because that's what I need to do. And so same with, with trafficking, it's, or just thinking that you're in love with this person and that you're helping them out by doing this to get your family money. Yeah. And then suddenly realizing down the road that this is not what was happening. Um, it's so easy to judge other people <laughs> and to make assumptions yeah. and to say, well, no one forced her to sleep with those guys, you know, that she chose to do that. Yeah. Is, is really eye opening. And unfortunately, our kids get a lot of those messages. Mm-hmm. I was giving a talk about trafficking. Um, at a church once and this one young man you could tell everyone was trying to get him to ask the question and he didn't want to because he was uncomfortable and he finally said he's like well we've heard that a lot of girls want to do this you know so I mean how do you 
how, how can you say that they don't want to, and, you know, without <laughs> trying not to be too graphic, but it's like, do you right. really want to have sex with someone who's older than your dad or that you don't know? Yeah. Nobody, nobody wants to do that. It's true. It's you true. know, so, you know, we've got to talk about it to our kids too, because they're going to fill their heads with what their peers are saying yeah. or what the internet is saying. And a lot of that isn't rooted in reality or truth. <laughs> so. Yeah, right. And, you know, um, at the bot, at the end of the day, the bottom line is it's illegal. <laughs> and a lot of yeah. these people, like, I can't remember the young lady's name. I want to say, oh, Shantoya, Shantoya Brown, uh, Shantoya Brown. Yes. Shantoya. And I remember watching her story and watching how people, oh, it, it makes me so angry to this day. This girl was what, 13 years old? She was 13. And they were treating her as if she was just, it was her fault. Like this man, this man was old enough yeah. to be her father. And like, oh, he had a family and he had this. Okay, well, he wasn't thinking about his damn family. We had a 13 year old little girl yep. in his bed and yep. nobody talked about that. Nobody yep. called that out. They're like, oh, but he's dead now and he left his family behind. And he was having sex with a kid. Yeah, oh and yeah. What's wrong with that to you? That yeah. bothered me so bad because this girl, so much of her life was taken away from her. At the end of the day, she was a child. And I think in a lot of our communities, we, especially in the black community, um, when, when things happen with our young girls, they're fast, okay? People yeah. like to tag them as fast, fast little girls. Fast. I heard it my whole life, fast little girls. Don't be one of those yeah. fast little girls. Or yeah, she's acting grown. Is she's acting uh, you grown. know she's yeah. smelling her ass. Like that's the things that, those are the terms that I would hear all of the time growing up. And even me, like I took on that identity, like of, of feeling like, oh, well, if I do this, I'm fast, or yeah. that judgment, because it was ingrained in me. Yep. You know what I mean? It's in it's in the culture. And a lot of the culture just looks down on these girls yeah. and treat them as if they're grown women, like they're adults and it's not fair. And psychologically think about what that's doing to these girls. This was a little girl. He, this man had no business even being anywhere near her. And she yeah. took all of that. She took all of that on herself and everybody was okay with putting it on her including the judge, has been around this type of thing and seeing so many things that have happened made you have conversations with your kids about it? So I've been talking to my, my kids, not, I mean, a little bit about trafficking, but m more so about uh, body boundaries. Mm -hmm. So ever since my, my oldest, who's now 12, ever since she was three, we've been having conversations about who safe people are mm -hmm. and about their bodies. So for example, you know, nobody gets to touch your private parts. Yeah. You know, and, and if we're at the doctor's office and mommy or daddy are there, that's okay because they're checking, mm -hmm. but no other time. And I, and I make sure to say like, not even grandma or grandpa or yeah. so-and-so. And I say names because I think we like to, we like to assume that family members are always safe. Right. And I'm not saying I, I think any of my family members are not safe people, but there's so often people who are abused by family members or close friends, and they don't know that it's wrong because they get told at a young age, hey, we love these people. You have to give them a hug goodbye. You have to give yeah. them a kiss. You should say, don't make the adult feel bad. And, and I've always made sure like, hey, if you don't want to hug so-and-so, you don't have to hug so-and-so. You only do it if you feel comfortable doing it. I never force my kids to hug people. Yeah. And if they get upset, which there have been people who have gotten upset by it, like that is that's your perfect. ego. That's yeah. your problem. Yeah. I'm never going to force my kid to violate their own boundaries to yeah. make another adult comfortable. I have a huge so problem. 
people who do that. So yeah, we've had a lots and lots of conversations and we have more conversations as they get older, but it's great to see how they've really like internalized that. And, and I'll still, to this day, like I'll ask them if I can have a hug. I just, I don't force it on them. I'm like, Hey, can I hug you? Or Hey, you know, whatever. Yeah. Or if they say stop about, you know, for tickling or really wrestling or whatever. And they, okay, stop. I immediately stop. Right. Because they should have the expectation that if they say stop to anyone ever in their life, that person should stop should touching them. Yeah. Instead of laughing or blowing it off. And I, I hear a lot from some parents like, oh, but you know, my kids are so young or, you know, and they're not, they're not too young. No. And if you're not going to have that conversation with them, they're going to figure it out another way. You know, there was a detective who came in, did a talk <clears throat> at a human trafficking thing a couple of years ago. And she was talking about how probably like once a week she was getting called to high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools because there are kids with cell phones who had naked pictures of their peers on them. Wow. And she was talking, the youngest was a nine and 10 year old who were sexting each other and sending naked pictures because that's what you did if you loved someone. Wow. And wow. so, <laughs> you know, these kids don't know that that's a crime, first of all, and can go on their record. Yeah. Um, but that the fact that they think that that's what you do if you love someone speaks to a lot deeper problems. <laughs> and we need to talk to our kids about just basic, um, excuse me, like knowledge about cell phones, right? You think you're just sending a picture to your boyfriend. Yeah. That could go everywhere. You know everywhere. what? It's out there and it will never be deleted. It'll never be removed. Nope. And uh, yeah, you never get it back. I think that it's a sad, it's sad that that's an issue that we deal with because, you know, I ain't have a cell phone like that. So I didn't get my first cell phone. So I went to the military. I was eight yeah. years old. I didn't know. I don't know about that life. I am so glad that I didn't have a childhood where there were cell phones present. I am too. It, we as as parents <laughs> and society and the community have a lot of work to do. I'm so glad about the work that you're doing. I'm so proud of you just to even know you and the work that you put in because you show up in the world. You show up and you're always doing something for other people. So I just wanted to celebrate you for that and just tell you that I'm so proud of you and to just know someone who cares. I, I wish more people would realize the gift you get when you show up for other people, yeah. you know? It's yes, I do nice things for people and I show up, but what I get in return, I feel like it's so much more than that, yeah. you know? One of the best pieces of advice that I've ever received is that no matter what you're going through, give. Yes. When you're going through your roughest moments, your, your biggest challenges, what do you do? Give. Yeah. When you don't have it, give. And yeah, absolutely. That it feeds your soul in a way that nothing else on this earth could ever feed your soul. And it also reminds you that you're going to be okay. Absolutely. I, I totally, I, I got goosebumps when you said that. I totally, I totally agree with that. I think that's, that's things I've had conversations with people who are really suffering through depression and anxiety and yeah. it's easy to insulate yourself. Um, I mean, it's not easy. I'm not blowing it off. Having depression and anxiety is awful um, and it is isolating, but if you can pull yourself up enough to do something for someone else, yeah, somehow, I mean, it doesn't have to be a big gesture. That's a step. But it's the best advice I've ever received and I would tell anybody the same thing. So I want you to tell me that you're a girl mom without telling me that you're a girl mom. My laundry room floor literally has glitter embedded into the pavement. I vacuumed, trying to wipe it up. It's just... It's glitter in it forever. Uh. <laughs> Tell me that you're married without telling me that you're married. 
only I seem capable of finding certain things in the fridge. Why it's sitting right there in front of your face? Yeah. Wait a minute. Go back, go back, go back, go back. We cannot skip what just happened. Oh my God. Did y'all catch this face? First of all, gentlemen, look, pay attention. I'm going to save you. If you, this is an award winning face right there. An award, every wife in America knows this face. Listen, if you ask where something is in the refrigerator and you get this look, I'm telling you, just go ahead, turn right back around because it's there. I mean, this is the perfect execution. Every wife knows this look. Hell, I almost went and looked in my refrigerator. In other words, the translation for the look that she is serving you right now is it's in your face. Look again, sir.